Okay, everybody, welcome back. Sorry about the technical glitch. Um, like the performances when I'm actually playing in the band, it, you can practice as much as you want, but when you try and go live, everything goes to the brown sticky stuff, I think is the expression. Anyway, to start again, my name's Dave Crozier. I'm ex-lead developer and software development manager at Flexipol Packaging, um, active on Profox, basically been uh, involved with VFP right from the the year dot. Uh, started on Fox, Fox Base, Fox Plus, DOS and Xenix. So we've seen all versions um, of this of uh, VFP. And I retired in June from Flexipol Packaging as development manager. Uh, the most recent project, which you'll be seeing a little bit of, is actually a two-year implementation of the Epicor MRP ERP system to replace the bespoke FlexiSpec system. I named it FlexiSpec that has been written over a 25-year period in excess of 3 million lines of uh, VFP code um, and being replaced by a bespoke off-the-shelf product that uh, the people at Epicor said would very easily be actually installed in about three months. Um, we're now up to three years and they've still not taken all the functionality of the old system back. But that's just one of those things. Um, system very, very good, like Epicor. It's very complicated. Hopefully we'll be able to run through it a little bit uh, when we actually uh, get into the presentation proper. So I'll run through the agenda and then I'll turn my camera off and uh, we can actually uh, you can actually see um, more of the screens, etc. So the agenda today is going to be looking at REST APIs, uh, effectively the whole of VFP, uh, the whole of Epicor was based around uh, access via an a the APIs uh, to get data in and out of the system. Um, in Epicor, the main access via APIs is using what they call BAQs, which stands for Business Activity Query. It's the equivalent of um, SQL Server Management Studio. Um, so you can generate uh, SQL code, you can generate the equivalent of uh, stored procedures, etc. and we'll show you how to actually, uh, or what it looks like. Um, we'll also look at something called Postman, for those of you who don't know what Postman is, it's an dev API development tool that you can actually freely download uh, and access APIs um, of your choosing, really, because most applications these days actually have APIs. Uh, we'll have a little bit of JSON. Um, for those of you who have not done JSON, it's a huge subject. You're probably best uh, talking to at any to any. Uh, anybody at depth, uh, to somebody like Rick Strahl on Jason, who's done an awful lot of work on it. Um, there's loads of resources. Jason is one of those bottomless pits that you can look into and you can delve down as deep as you want. Um, we'll also then, within Postman, look at public APIs, things that are available to the general public. I'll show you some public APIs and how to pull data from public sites. And then, uh, Probably the end, the end bit is why I actually got into or how I got into the REST API side. I found it very, very difficult um, to actually access the REST API. So I decided to use something called Chillcat, which is an ActiveX component and also a .NET component, um, which I found on the net, started to use it to start with for FTP purposes, because I needed secure FTP, uh, and then found out all the other things that were in there, and then other API resources. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the camera off, um, and we'll jump into the presentation. Okay, any questions that anybody has, then please uh, put them up to uh, to Tamar. She'll, I'll be happy to ask, uh, answer them uh, as and when I can. And um, if we haven't covered your question, then at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll actually have a, a small Q and A session. Or if, yep. if you left your camera on and turned your screen oh, share sorry. off, I don't think that's what you meant to do. It's not what I went to do. That's what I meant to do. Sorry about that. Technical glitch number two. Your fault. My my problem. Your fault. 
so we'll blame everybody else for it. Okay. So you, you let, still need to share your screen. Uh, sh sh come on. Right, Tamar, can you just confirm to me that should show the screen that says agenda on there? Yes. Excellent. Okay, we're back and running. Okay, this is like the Apollo 13. It has <laughs> ramifications of that. So here we go. Let's let's jump into, into the system properly. Okay, first of all, what's a REST, what does REST API stand for? Um, I've only been looking at it for probably 18 the 18 months prior to retiring okay so let's have a look at what rest api is restful api or rest api is an application programming in interface an api that conforms to the constraints of the rest architecture rest standing for representational state transfer service and it was created by a computer scientist called Roy Fielding. I don't know whether Roy was uh, uh, English or American, but he was obviously a very uh, tuned in guy. Um, it seems to have actually replaced um, SOAP. I use SOAP an awful lot um, going back about four or five years ago, and I found it very, very, very unwieldy. Uh, it did the job, it was slow, but it was difficult to implement, even though VFP managed it. Uh, again, Rick did an awful lot of work on SOAP, and he has lots of nice, good white papers, which I actually used, along with his software. Um, but to various levels of success, to be perfectly honest, I found that it was so difficult to actually modify um, that I, I gave up in the end. And there was a gentleman on Profox called Alan Pollard, who was a very good friend of mine, unfortunately now deceased. And Alan did an awful lot of, of work on the uh, using SOAP for his airport software. He actually owned a company called Gatwick Soft, and they used to actually do all the movement software. Um, and he was using SOAP to actually send and receive data from the airfield to actually put onto uh, screens and other applications that he wrote in VFP. Uh, unfortunately, Alan passed away about four years ago. Okay, so what is an API? That's probably the favorite thing to ask. Well, an API, for those of you who don't know, it's a set of definitions and protocols for building and integrating application software. It's a set of rules. It's the rule book that you can actually go by. It tells you what data you're going to uh, pick up, how you're going to pick it up, and in what format that data is going to be when it ev eventually arrives with you. So it's a contract between the information provider, which is the, the equivalent of the server, say SQL Server, and the information user, which is you, the consumer. And, you defi and the API defines the content that is required. Okay, so REST API allows us to send data between the main data source and the client application. So and data transfer is available in one of several formats. HTTP, which has obviously been around for a long time. JSON, which is now the most popular. Okay, as I say, I'll go a little bit into JSON, um, but it's a, it's a bottomless pit. Uh, HTML, XLT, Python, if you want to actually do the uh, transfer in Python, or plain text. We'll see uh, a couple of examples of plain text. Uh, API calls um, when we get along further into the uh, into the presentation. Okay, so what may why does an API become what we call restful? Well, in order to be considered restful, an API must comply to certain rules. The main one being that the client server architecture made up of the client server and resources with requests must be made through HTTP. You're at the end of the internet. You're going to actually ask for data. HTTP seems to be the protocol to actually send uh, data uh, and receive data. 
most importantly, it has to be what we call stateless. In other words, no client information is stored between requests. You ask for a request, uh, you make the request, the data is actually processed and pulled at the server end, and it's actually sent back to you uh, in a separate, effectively, package. And the two, the client and the, um, and the server are totally unconnected in real time. You make request, it's processed, and then you receive the data back. Okay, so there is also a uniform interface between the components so that information is always transferred in standard form. We mentioned JSON. Uh, what you're going to see today will probably, uh, it's going to be mostly JSON or free text, um, both forms of which VFP can consume very, very easily. So the next thing to make an API RESTful is that all physical hardware architecture has to be invisible to the client. Okay, you don't really know whether you're communicating with an IBM 36148 or another VFP machine uh, or a VFP server or uh, an Amazon web, web service. It really shouldn't make any difference to, you, difference to you as a client. All right. The other thing we can do uh, within RESTful APIs is we can actually use what's called code on demand, which allows the server to send code from the server to the client when requested. That isn't a normal instance. Um, and in this way, we can extend the client functionality, but we'll not cover this uh, because it's a fairly advanced topic. And I must admit, not to knowing that much about it myself. Um, so I can, I can probably answer questions about it, but not go into any great detail. But that's one of the things that I want to actually investigate during my retirement, now that I've actually got time. So we mentioned SOAP before. Well, I think that the REST API going forward is much easier to use than SOAP. For those of you who have not used SOAP, it's Simple Object Access Protocol. Um, it works. It's there. It's not the fastest thing in the world, okay? Um, it normally requires XAML messaging, uh, and XAML can be an absolute pain uh, in itself, but it's got built-in security and it's got transactional compliance. But as I say, it's not something that I would use out of precedence. REST API is very, very lightweight. You don't need much code at the client end to actually process and generate the requests on the server. It's much easier to use than SOAP, and it allows more end application customization, as hopefully you'll be able to see uh, later on. It's certainly much faster. It's got increased scalability if you want to go up to uh, cloud servers, etc. And the thing to remember that SOAP is a protocol REST is not a protocol, but you should find now that REST is the industry standard now, especially with the Internet of Things, because most things will actually be using REST APIs to communicate. Okay, any questions? Perfect timing, because we just got one. The question is, isn't SOAP for Microsoft only and REST is more universal? Okay, I can see we've got a question from Barbara on there. Isn't SOAP to Microsoft Microsoft only? Yes, it is. That's another. That's one of the things I didn't I didn't actually put on the uh, on the presentation. But yeah, it was in, it was it was produced by Microsoft and no other vendors. And um, well, it certainly isn't a standard feature within other operating systems on there. Okay, and Dave, I'll, I'll grab the questions and just okay. read them to you when you don't need to look at the chat. So if we go on, let's have a look at REST APIs and the structure. Well, we mentioned that we've got a client. We're the client sat there. We've got our VFP pro program sat and generating REST API requests. 
that's going up to the server. Think about the server as being SQL Server. That's the easiest way to think about it. And you've got a network in between. And that network infrastructure, remember we said that the network infrastructure and the hardware has got to be has got to be totally um, has got to be totally uh, independent. No, I can't hear uh, Paul. I can't hear Tamar at all. Okay, let me see. Is she actually muted? I was muted. I uh, can you hear me now? Tamar, Dave? you seem to be muted on my uh, on my screen. Ah, then hover over. <laughs> over. Tamar, come back to me. Turn it off. Muting. Unmute. I've unmuted you now. Now Tamar, can you hear so me? Now can you hear me? I've turned off me. Well, I never turned it on, Tamar. <laughs> so if it was turned on, then I guess it's from your end. But mm -hmm. I do apologize about that. Okay, so can I hear you now, Tamar? Can't hear anything. No, you've gone can, muted can, again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No, Tamar, can't hear you at all. We'll continue. I can still see the chat. So if anybody... If anybody wants to actually put a question in, uh, I can pick it up from the chat on there. So we've got a client, we've got the network, we've got the server. Richard says that Tamar's trying. Well, she's very trying at the moment. It keeps on going on mute, Tamar. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. So this brings us to... The reason why I was originally getting involved in REST APIs was via Epicor, this humendous or humongous MRP ERP system. Extremely powerful, extremely complex. And if any of you have any dealings with it, you'll find out just how big it is. It's a monolith of a program. Okay. And... Things I can't. Uh, Tamar, I can't. I don't know where you actually mean about hovering over the Geek Gatherings icon on there. I can't see anything that allows me to actually unmute it. So. If you put things in the chat, I can still see the chat. Apologies, apologize to everybody uh, about this. Um, okay, so Epicor. We'll delve into Epicor. I can show you how Epicor actually works. It has, as we said, an API interface for business objects, business objects being the things which you can use to drive data into and pull data out of from Epicor. Uh, and it uses the equivalent of BAQs, these business activity queries, uh, which it uses for transferring data and pulling data back out of the Epicor system. Very, very similar, as I said, to Microsoft SQL, uh, SQL Server Studio in there. So what you're going to see... ...is a business activity uh, query designer. This is an example on there and i'll just tab through and we'll pick up epicor okay you should be able now to actually see uh, the epicor screen this is the main login screen to epicor this was my development screen actually at flexipol um, there are millions and millions of parts to the program um, if you do a th thing like a search there's this goes on forever and a day uh, there are something like 900 separate modules within Epicor. Let's go back to the menu. We have something special called business ac activity. So business activity, BAQ, we'll load that up. I just need to resize this to your screen size because I have it running in very high res. Okay. And this is where we actually do all our uh, all our business activity queries, and we pull them back. So I'll look at the query ID. I'll do a search on everything that starts with RDC because I called all my BAQs um, 
and we'll pick we'll pick it up you will notice that this looks very very similar to a sql inquiry and that's exactly what it is okay we have a query builder in here where you can drop a table from these are all some of the an example of some of the tables which are actually within epicor there and business objects as well you can drop tables you can actually link them together um you can do any sorts of joins that you want you can do sub queries i won't bother going into those unless anybody wants to later on after the presentation because it gets quite complicated so you pick yourself a a, a table these are all the fields down the right hand side okay that you can see the fields that you've got available this is a dead simple one it's a country lookup file or country lookup table and we're going to actually pull back the display fields which are in this column here we're going to pull back the company that this table belongs to because uh epicor is a multi-company system a, a multi uh yeah multi-company so you can have more than one company running uh, for the enterprise you have a country number a description a currency code an iso code and an e whether they're an eu member or not we can run this the SQL effectively by testing it out here and those of you who have used uh, VFP will recognize this you've got a two-dimensional grid um, within there so this is coming back in a format that you can recognize it's a browse window effectively that you can scroll up and down you can sort it uh, you can actually uh, put it in any order that you want okay so let's have a look at how that looks okay in terms of being able to pull data back from the api so i'll just change screens on here and we'll go into right i seem to have actually lost my uh my main screen i'll just create it again okay on here again i just need to resize this screen okay this is like the main help screen for the epicor rest api the main help page and you can see that it directs everything to a server this is a server and we have three environments or they had three environments down at flexipol they had a pilot environment a live environment um and an educational environment um so this is where the server's pointing to which gets all the data so if api keys are required you use this format okay to actually get api keys you can access apis uh in two ways you can either do it using standard um authentication which is name and password but the name and password is actually converted into a 64 it's encoded in 64 uh, bit and then sent out up and down the line for security purposes or you can actually say you can send an api key which is pre-generated on the host and then you have the api key and using the api key you can access all the api information that you want so here's some of the, a list of all the uh, the uh, api calls we've got a list of business objects all these business objects are things like a customer being a business object you can access the customer data you can pull data you can push data etc etc okay you can see there are hundreds and hundreds of them and each one of these actually drills down into a sub business object as well so i'm not bothering going into any of those um, what we'll do is we'll look more at business activity queries so here's the business activity query this is what a call to an api in epicor is going to look like if you do it through a web browser okay it has that format so you can see you have the server name you've got a company we've got we've got parameters in there you can also send an api key if you want so it's most most of the apis that you'll see will have a help a help page like this where you can get some information on how to use them this gives you an example so it's doing a get it's doing a get on the pilot api 
of a, a BAQ service, whatever that BAQ name is, and it's going to send some parameters down to it. OK, so I'm going to actually pick up that BAQ again. I'm going to pick up my RDC country, which is in there. Let's get the RDC. Now, we've gone into something now that's called Swagger. OK, um, Epicor have implemented Swagger, which is a, a third party piece of it's a third party interface that lots of APIs now do actually use. And you can actually just get a, um, a Swagger app that you can run APIs through. But Epicor have it as their standard way of testing out um, APIs. OK, so uh, this is a server that we looked at before. Tell, this is the company that I'm getting information from. I've told it I want RDC country as the BAQ, that SQL, uh, that SQL statement that you saw before. Let's execute that BAQ. And we do it using a GET. And it says, do you want to try it out? Yes, you can try it out. All this information here is any parameters. If you send an API request, you might well may well want to sort it in a particular order. You may well want to actually filter it and get back data uh, that's a subset of the main data that's generated on the server. I'm not going to put any filter strings on here. And the filter strings will depend upon how the API is designed. So if we try it out, OK, and what we can execute it down here, OK, this is the response that you're going to get back, the type of response you're going to get back. Let's execute that command. And that will now execute it. Here's the executed requested URL that we've got. And you can see, similar to the Epicor browse table, here is all the data in JSON format, sorted if we wanted it, filtered out if we wanted it, all the fields that have come back in JSON. So now you can actually use JSON, uh, or you can get VFP to strip this out um, effectively um, it's coming back as a set of what they call values. OK, this is most important because if you look at JSON, JSON can be ser what's called serialized, which is effectively ne nested. So you, you can't you cannot just send flat files uh, via JSON. You can send file embedded files with it or sub files within a JSON record. And then it be becomes very complicated. I'd suggest that you look at Rick Strahl's um, website on there in terms of serialization and deserialization. Luckily, I've not had to deal with deserialization very much because all the stuff that comes out of Epicor is flat file. So it comes out like a, a standard VFP SQL select on there. OK, so you can see the this is the data that you get back. OK with all the records in there, and you can download that, you can process it, you can fire it into any JSON um, serializer or, or deserializer that you want, and that should work absolutely fine. But one thing you might notice up here is that we've actually got a request URL. And if I copy that, I should be able to actually just put that into a web browser and run it. And lo and behold, we get back without using a REST API, without using any client software, we're just getting back the raw JSON into the web browser. And you can see it's totally unformatted. OK, it's in text format, but it's JSON. It's effectively JSONized. So that's another way of being able to get data back. One thing about JSON it's worthwhile thinking about is that you don't actually have field types and field lengths, OK? Everything is defined just by a field identifier. OK, so that gives us, um, that's allowed us to have, have a look at our uh, use Swagger to pull data back. So if we now go back to, uh, well, we've seen the next one. You've seen the next slide. You've seen Epicor in action, accessing the B, uh, BAQ designer. OK, you've seen the Kinetic uh, REST API help page. You've seen how to actually pick things up, how to actually generate a BAQ, how to pull the data back, which you've got there. 
execute it. Uh, and with, using Swagger, if you just use, always use the get request and then actually execute it, that will pull the data back and you can investigate what's in there. Okay, and that's the data that we just looked at. And the final one is the one that you saw on the web browser, whereby you're pulling it back. You don't need any uh, REST API software. All you need is the correct format of the REST API call. And obviously, I've pre-authenticated this, so I'm allowed to look at FlexiPol's data. But normally, if you ran this command, it would ask you for a login. Uh, a pass, a, a username and a password, and that would actually pull back the allow you to pull back this uh, REST API data. Okay, so now we can move on to the thing that I mentioned at the beginning, which is Postman, which is a completely free piece of software, and you download it from this web address. Um, and these two versions of the software. There is a web-based version of Postman, and there is actually an application version of Postman. Um, I don't like the web-based version. I must admit, you can use it if you want, but the web-based version will point you to downloading an app uh, by default, and you can run Postman, and you can run it on Windows, OS X, Apple Mac, OS X, um, as I said, I've said on, on here that the, the, the web version is not as good as the app. Sign up for an account. It's totally free. You can actually use it in Teams. You can export your Postman data and import your Postman data. You can share your APIs between members of your team. If you want, I think if you want to go any more than a team of four or five, then it is, it is payable. Uh, it is chargeable. Um, but I found using it on my own um, is absolutely ideal. So there we go. So use it as an individual or a team. You can set up a collection of your own APIs. You can save all the states of them. So once you've tested out your API, you can save it in a list and you can have a collection of APIs that you can then share with other members of the team. Um, you can run API tests. You can string the tests of an API. If one API sends data back, which then calls another API, then you can actually string everything up in a in a long list as, uh, with tests in there. And you've got testing at the end of an API. When the data comes back, if there's data there or there's certain types of data there, you can kick off another API. So it's very, very uh, extensive in what it will do. I'm not going to cover any of the API tests. I've used them in isolation, but not used them um, in anger, so to speak. And you can see the output of your API in various formats, like we saw with Swagger and with the web uh, browser. You can see it in text format, you can see it in JSON format, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we're going to look at next. Okay. And you can see this is this is the interface that um, Postman gives you. You can look at the full, all, on all the tabs up at the top, you can see the used API history what you've used. You can see all your collections of APIs. I've got a collection called public REST APIs in there, which will actually load in. Once we've gone through this screen, we'll have a look at them. You have environment variables, things like login credentials. You can set them up once and you can apply them to a full collection of APIs. You can send parameters, any number of parameters, depending upon what the API requires. You can set these parameters up there. Um, all your APIs, you can give your own names. And if you look at the bottom here, we have an API return result. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at, if I can find it, Postman. Okay, this should give you Postman. Right, here's our Postman. So what I've got here, let's pick up our RDC country. If you remember, this is the API that we just looked at in Swagger. We generated it as a BAQ. If I now, so, and that's, the, this is exactly the same call that I used in the web browser, but I'm now sending it through um, Postman. If I send, the request comes back and I can look at the data that's come back. Again, it's in the same format that you saw in Swagger. Um, we've actually got 
uh, all the individual fields with the data next to them. Again, notice, notice no data definition. OK, you have to sort that out for yourself, basically. Um, and we've got metadata in there, which is the data that you're sending down. You can look at it in raw format. That's the data that we actually saw in the web browser. Um, we can we can oh, we can't visualize it, but we can actually have a look at it in straight text format the way it comes down. OK. So there's various methods that you can actually look at your data. So um, let's have a look at a few of these things. Uh, we've got these these REST APIs. If you just do a, a general search on REST API, public REST APIs, you'll get loads of them. OK, um, let's try a couple of them. There's, I know there's a couple of these don't work. So if I pick one that doesn't work, I do apologize. OK, send the request. We get back all the dogs. And this is like, you can see this is serialized JSON because within one JSON answer, there might well be, a di so uh, uh, for Boo Hunt or Boo Hunt, there, there is one type, a Norwegian, but on Bulldog, there's three types. There's a Boston Bulldog, an English Bulldog, and a French Bulldog. So you can see how you end up with nested JSON uh, within there. Look at the raw data. Again, it's a bit confusing. Um, initially, I started writing VFP to pull back this raw data, uh, and it's a complete nightmare. Uh, it really is. You tend to get lost. So you're best actually using the JSON format to pull it back. And within Chillcat, there is there are actually a set of really good routines uh, to deal with JSON uh, as it's there. Right. Okie dokie. So what else can we actually have? Uh, let's have a look at, uh, we'll have a look at, it's, this says makes of cars. It's not really makes of cars. It tells lies. Okay. This is getting data back. You can see that we've actually got the data back. I can show you this now. I'll, I can show you this being used in v Visual Fox Pro. Um, so if we just jump to my Visual Fox Pro proggy. Okay. I've got a public API here. I've got car manufacturers which is the one that you've just seen. Car manufacturer, execute it. And this is using the chill cat. And you can see what I've done here is I've pulled it back in flat file format with one record just being put into a memo, a memo field. So it's one field per record. Obviously, you could have pulled this out if it wasn't serialized, Jason. Uh, you could have actually pulled it out into individual fields. Um, and you'll be able to see that uh, in a couple of the other things which I'll run. So that's showing data coming back as one record or one record in VFP per one record on the API. Okay. Car makers, this is serialized JSON as well. Okay. This comes back and you can see that you've actually got, this is just in text format. OK, I've noticed that Tom's actually put on there recommending Fiddler, uh, Fiddler 2. It, uh, Fiddler 2 is very, very good. Um, I find that excellent and have used it myself. And, uh, and Paul Tarver is actually right. Postman is one of the best tools for actually looking at uh, API requests that you could actually have, even if you had to pay for it. Um, it's very, very good. So that's one. So let's look at this dog breeds because this is what we did before. Dog breeds. Now, I mentioned that when we saw the data that came out before, we actually had a tag at the front of the uh, JSON that said value. Now, this is this effectively means that you have a tag array. A tag array allows you to actually um, split the data into individual data types or record types. Now, this doesn't have a tag array, so it comes back like this. The best way to actually look at it in VFP is into is, is just as a memo field. Okay, so you've got multi. Where if you remember, we had um, uh, a, a bulldog, which was the three types of bulldogs. Uh, within there. So Bulldog, you've got Boston, English and French, and you can see how it's actually embedded. So you've got the main field in there of Bulldog. 
and you've got three different types, but that could be an unlimited number of types. And each one of those fields could have subfields in there as well. So dealing with that in a flat file database like VFP is very, very difficult. Um, so you're best getting the data out in text mode. Okay. Um, we have another um, Game of Thrones characters, which we've actually got. We can pull that back and you can see this memo field. I've just dropped everything into a memo field here. And you can see all the Game of Thrones, for those of you who are, who are um, big fans, um, you can see everything to do with uh, Game of Thrones characters that you can pull out, you can filter, uh, you can make different requests. You can actually start getting data ab about each individual character in Game of Thrones if you want. And as I say, the best thing I found here, because you can't fit it all in one field of 254 characters, throw it into a, a memo field, and then it can be up to 64K, uh, 64 uh, meg on there. Okay. Uh, pet food facts. I'll just run through a, a few of these. Okay. Exactly the same thing. You've got loads of pet food facts with um, websites to actually go to. And again, the most difficult thing I find about REST APIs is deciding what data you actually want to retrieve back. Once you've decided on where the server is and how to formulate your request, then it's very easy to actually pull data back. And then cryptocurrency prices for you, those of you who are into Bitcoin, okay, you can actually see all the Bitcoin. This is a live session this is pulling back live bitcoin prices uh, and rates highs and lows um, from the site and if anybody wants to have a look at the coding in here uh, i will I'll, I'll issue it after the presentation um, because it has changed a little bit uh, since I, I did all this all the apis have changed and uh, you can actually have a look at how to pull this data back um, geolocation of your ip address I've got my IP address here, and if it works, yes, it's been successful. It's told me I'm in the United Kingdom. I'm in England. I'm just north of Manchester. It gives me my latitude, my longitude, okay? Uh, and it tells me uh, who I'm actually with. I'm, a, I'm with Sky UK as an internet provider, all from my IP address. And that's a standard public API that you can all access. One thing which I think is quite good here, I can look up UK vehicle details from the government web website. Um, you need to have an API key to do this. And when you get it, only allows you to actually pull back data of registration numbers that have an A in there. Um, so you can't do it with anything else. So let's pull, let's just pull this data back. Okay. And you can see that we've actually got the registration mark of the vehicle is there. It tells you what vehicle it is. It gives you loads of technical details about it, what type it is. My wife's car actually has an A in the registration number. Uh, her name is Paula. So we've got a personalized registration number, P40 LAC, and that should actually come back within there. And it, it does. It comes back and it, the data may, on the vehicle may not be entirely up to date. The reason is she's taken that off her old car and she's actually got it on what's called uh, a retention certificate so that when she gets a new car, she can put the registration number back on there. But her old car was actually a Toyota, uh, sorry, not a Toyota, a Hyundai. And these are the date. This is the data, the wheelbase, the car length, et cetera, et cetera, valves per cylinder. All the information. It's amazing what information you can find off a standard government website. Okay, just by putting in a registration number, or what, I forget what you call it in the states, but uh, you know, on there, there it's a high. It was a high end die. It's a CRDI. Okay, so that's just a small example of what you can do with API calls. Uh, our Epic or Get Country, which we did before. This is showing you how to do that. You can see I've got the data again in in a just in in a message box. I can actually look in here because this was a flat file. Okay, in other words, all the all the data came out of one table as a flat different fields in the table. 
And the fields were the company, the country number, the description, the currency code, et cetera, et cetera, for all the countries. So this lends itself really well to VFP because it's one record. Effectively, it's like a browse window. And that's all I've done is I've thrown it into a browse window. Uh, I didn't need to deserialize the JSON. All I actually did was pull the data back and feed it into a VFP cursor. Okay, so that should allow you to get some information, more better information or better a better handle on um, using Postman. It's a fairly complicated system uh, on the top of it, but once you get into it, it's fairly easy to actually use. Okay, so how do we access this API in VFP? We've talked about Chillcat. You've seen VFP using Chillcat, and you've seen option number one, which is via the browser. Um, we could actually put the web address into an embedded browser um, and pull data back. Unfortunately, um, that's not the fastest way to do it. You don't want to be loading a browser in VFP as, um, as an external object and then firing data into it. Uh, you can use standard libraries, which are already available in VFP. Uh, from Again, from Rick. Rick is a great resource when it comes to pulling back information on, on uh on, on APIs and SOAP, et cetera, et cetera. And it, I, I've, I've spelt Rick's its components. I'm sorry about that, Rick. I do apologize. Okay. Uh, Rick's components. Okay. Uh, we can actually use third-party add-on software designed to run with VFP. And as I say, Chillcat was the one for me that was the best uh, piece of software to actually use. Oh, and also... Uh, I noticed Tom's put on there um, easy JSON classes under uh, NF JSON. I use those quite a bit. I'd, I've actually got some demonstrations of using those to ser serialize and deserialize data. And uh, if you want to have a look at those, I'll discuss them afterwards. And good old Bill's come in. I only found out um, the last, the first day of the of the conference, that Bill had actually put together a wrapper for, or he's putting together a wrapper for Chillcat, and um, I've not had chance to have a really good look at it. Well done, Bill. Thank you very much for that. Um, Bill's, uh, I'm sure Bill will actually be able to uh, put up a, a, a link for you to download it in the chat if you're interested. Okay. Um, Boudwin's actually asked, is it possible to read Google data? Yes, it is. But setting up your authentication in Google is a minefield. And I found it's very, very inconsistent. Um, no, but no, it, yes, you can actually do it. And Chillcat have a lot of examples. And Bill's actually said, uh, was it Bill said it on there? Um, yeah, Chillcat is fine. If you buy the light, you can actually use it free. Okay, there are certain components in Chillcat that you can basically download and you can run them free of charge. I think it's a um, a 14-day license that you get and it just puts up a, a nag notice whenever you run Chillcat. Um, having said that, it's $100. It's worthwhile buying and we'll have a look at Chillcat next. Okay. Uh, so Chillcat ActiveX, I use the ActiveXs within VFP because I found it was the quickest way for me to do it. Uh, I've been used to dealing with ActiveXs, but Chillcat comes with a set of .NET um, DLLs, which, and I think Bill actually uses uh, the DLLs rather than the ActiveXs. And it contains over 90 classes uh, with support for REST, FTP, which is how I originally got in. Uh, into Chillcat, I needed SFTP. I'd written FTP myself from scratch in VFP that's actually posted on Profox, but everybody wanted to actually have SFTP. And I tried to write it, failed dismally, um, and decided to look elsewhere. And Chillcat pointed me in the right direction. So if you want to use SFTP or FTP2, then Chillcat has the components for you to use. It's got a very sensible lifetime licensing model, and it's totally royalty-free, just like VFP. 
So you can basically include it with your application. You embed your activation key uh, within your executable and people can actually utilize it uh, and you can distribute it as many times as you want. So I find it's an excellent piece of software. OK, so let's have a look at the Chillcat site um, so we can. OK. Just loading up the Chillcat site here. Okay, so if you go on to Chillcat, chillcatsoft.com, okay, this is the software, okay, it's got over 90 classes, there's hundreds of them, um, the ones that I was interested in, obviously, FTP, SS, uh, SFTP, uh, I've used it for sockets as well, and I've used it for IMAP, um, some of them are free, all the JSON components are actually free. So you can use them as many times as you want. It's available over all because they're ActiveXs and .NET assemblies. It's available over all these languages. So once you buy the product once, you can utilize it over all the uh, all the all the uh, programming languages, and it'll run on Windows, Linux, OS X, iOS, Android, you name it. It will actually run on it. Okay. So we can look at the examples. Let's have a look at the examples. You can see the examples. You basically need to um, look at what you're actually doing. And if you look down here, you will see Visual Fox Pro. How many active components these days actually still support Visual Fox Pro? Okay. And here's some of the component examples which you can see. So you've got Amazon. You can connect to Amazon. Uh, Boudwin asked, asked about Google. You've got all the Google APIs here that you can actually look at with example um, example VFP code. Now, I think Bill was right in saying, uh, and I will stand by that, some of these examples that are actually in Chillcat are pseudocode. They're a bit of VFP. Most, Lots of them work, lots of them don't. Some of them are a mixture of VFP code and also uh, basic. Uh, and also a little bit of C sharp. So you've really got to actually download them and play around and get the uh, the syntax of everything right. If we look at the JSON ones, uh, or rest, let's have a look at the rest. You've got rest, simple rest examples. Okay, so this is a simple get uh, a get using rest. You actually set up you all you what you actually do is you create your chillcat object, your rest object. You authenticate it with a global unlock and you actually have an activation key and a username, which is yours when you buy the product. That activates the product. You only have to do it once um, within your VFP application and then everything is available. All these uh, all these individual uh, calls are, are, are available, all the objects. And then having set up, having set up your, your REST object, you actually set up a server of where you want. Remember in in the um, in the application that we looked at, I did a get. A get says get data from this server and pull it back into either VFP or whatever you want. Sorting this out is the biggest problem. Your actual call, what server am I calling and what do I need to include in this? OK, lots of it is is trial and error. It really is. You come back with a. Uh, a success method, yes or no. You then get a response into the vari local variable LC response JSON, and that's the JSON response that you can then do what you want. Uh, you can pull it back, and they have a full set of JSON uh, within uh, within Chillcat. Having pulled your data back in JSON, you can now look at your JSON as an array of objects. Okay. So there's your JSON. It will pull it back as an array of objects. OK, so here's your JSON string. This is as it came down from uh, the, that you saw in Postman. So your API call will come come down like this. OK, your REST API call. And then you deserialize it and throw it into an, an array of objects um, or a collection of objects. 
um, or a VFP cursor, as I'd actually done. Okay. Um, Boudwin has asked, are all ActiveX components available for 64-bit VFPA? I think they are. I've not tried um, VFPA, but I believe that you can still actually use uh, the 64-bit um, ActiveX controls because they're, they're available. Um, you can get the 64-bit ActiveXs as part of your subscription when you buy Chillcat, uh, which I find is very, very good. So that's... Let's go back to uh, let's go back to the slide. Not many more to go now, guys. I won't be boring you that that much longer. Okay. So this is an example. You've you uh, go on the help on the help page. These are example all the VFP examples for just rest. Um, as I say, some of them. Try them all. Some of them will work. Some of them won't. Some of them will be close to working. Uh, the things like the Google ones, if you try and actually do a, an API, a REST API call to Google, they obviously don't give you the, the authentication within Chillcat. You've got to actually sort your own authentication keys out with Google. And then you can use the, uh, the components without any trouble. Okay, so... Chillcat integration into VFP. You've seen that, okay? We sh you saw how using it in VFP. Let me show you VFP again. Um, let's go to the right page. Uh, Foxfest, BAQ country. If anybody wants to have a look at, let's modify this. You can see the code that's in here, okay? This is part of another program. Uh, so I can actually use it in all the three environments within Epicor. I can use it in the pilot, the third environment or the live environment. I say I want to actually pull back RDC country, which was the BAQ that you saw. I'm now throwing some parameters into there. Okay, if I want to throw parameters in there, um, of a start date and end date. Um, this isn't relevant to the country one. This is relevant for the application I'll show you at the end, whereby I'm pulling back manufacturing data from Epicor and throwing it into VFP via a date range. Okay, so we actually pick up the correct environment. The correct environment says, which server am I using? Okay, I've got two parts to the uh, to the server address. I've got the main server address, which is the one where I need to log into. So having created the Chillcat object, the REST object, what I do is I get a username and password. I convert that to uh, base64 string so that it's authenticated. I then say I'm you which type of authentication I'm using. If I'm using standard uh, string base64 authentication then i use basic authentication if i'm using an api key i use what's called a bearer token and that's something that's generated from the server so i then connect to the server and if you notice i'm connecting to the url of the server and the url of the server okay is here it's not the full request okay so the full request actually contains the uh, effectively like a subfolder of where to get data from. But you need to sort out what's the server address, and that's the one that you need to connect to. So having connected to the server, you connect on a particular port. Standard uh, REST APIs will always connect on 443. Whether you want it to actually auto-reconnect, okay, whether you want it to do any retries, you get a success or failure. You then get the response back in a single character variable, having done a, bet, a get. So you've now connected to the server. You've done a full request with no body. Okay. So we actually get all the data in raw format back. Okay. And then if we've actually got the response back, I'll run this separately when we finish with this, we then can set up a JSON object and we can deserialize it and actually pull it into this tags array. Okay, so if I run that, that should, I think this will run. 
Yeah, there it is. So that's actually pulled back the JSON request as a string. And then do I want to go into debug mode? I'll say yes. Okay, debug mode. I've now pulled it all out. I've deserialized it and I've put it into a flat file database. And Epicor sends back a row, a row, call, a row identifier, which is unique for each record in the database. Okay, so that's that. Now, the end result of all this, okay, is I actually wrote a suite of software to pull data back out of Epicor, basically because Epicor couldn't do the, the processing because it's very difficult to generate different new apps in Epicor. It's not the easiest of things to do because everything's C sharp. So I actually wrote this little front end in VFP and I called it FlexiCore. OK, and what it does is it picks the plant, which is the one uh, Flexipol actually run uh, three plants, OK, within there. And the Haslingdon is the plant. You put a date range, OK, a start date and an end date. You then actually can do an extract of data. Um, now, originally, this extract of data they wanted to do it over a 12-month period. The problem is with the 12-month period is that as soon as you send an API request that's pulling back, we're talking megabytes of data here, okay, you can end up getting the server timing out. So what I had to do here with a start date and an end date, I generate an individual request for each day. So I'm doing it between the first and the third of the third. This is DDMMYYYY. Uh, for you Americans, uh, rather than uh, MMDD. So it's the 1st of March to the 3rd of March. So I do three separate API requests. I can pull back different, uh, different individual um, departments to get all the data. I've got different report types. And if I just do a print, okay, you can see it's now going, oops, let's start that again. I'll just rerun that again because obviously I've been using it before. We've done very well so far. I was most surprised that we've not actually gone wrong before. Okay, run my little stub of code to set up the environment and run main again and run that. And you can see now it, it did three requests then. Now, Bear in mind, those three requests have generated something like 80 meg of data. And this is all the manufacturing figures for all the jobs that have gone through um, and in different formats. So we've got three operations, extrusion, conversion, and print. Okay. And this gives you all the total standard VFP reporting using um, Foxy pre uh, Preview on there. And then it gives you the next report because I selected them all. It gives you the total of each machine and what they've produced in terms of quantity, how much scrap, how much time it's taken them, et cetera, et cetera. And yet another report, all from the one set of data. Okay. So it is actually quite involved. And you can select which reports you actually want. OK, I think we're just about at the end. So I will let's pick up my. Uh, my jet my screen again. Right. OK, so what have we gone through? We've gone through the you've seen the the rest APIs generated car manufacturers, Game of Thrones characters, etc. You've seen my FlexiCore module, which is an end user piece of software, uh, totally flexible. Uh, once you get the data into VFP, you can obviously do anything you want with it. Uh, these are the reports, just examples of the reports that you actually get out of it. I mentioned again, additional VFP JSON software available from Rick. OK, uh, VFPX JSON, which um, I forget it was who 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 mentioned it uh, on the on the site, and also Craig Boyd actually has some JSON class libraries. Craig's not been around for years now, 
Um, if you, but but some of his data, uh, some of his programs are still there. And the Jason class by Mark Marco Platzer, um, I think, was mentioned in the chat before as well. So to summarise for you guys, and I hope it's been useful. Okay, what you've learnt or should have not learnt, but been able to know that it's available. You should know what a REST API is, how to recognize what it is and how it operates. Or oh, I can't spell how. H-O-E, that's terrible. It's not been properly proofread. You can use Postman. You know how to download Postman. Use it and abuse it. It's not the easiest of software to use at a, a, at a deep level, but you can get going with it very, very quickly. And you can test out any API call that you want. Um, you now understand about Epicor and what a BAQ is and how easy it is to extra, extract data once you've got the API definition into VFP and display the data in a cursor. And there are other sources of API information available on the net. And don't forget, at the end of the day, VFP rocks, which we all know, so I don't really need to tell you that. Anybody wants to contact me, they can actually get me at this email address, and I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any queries or give you any code or any assistance I can. And obviously, afterwards in the workshop, um, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to um, look at any questions and queries that you've got. Okay. okay Thank you, guys. Yeah.